you choir, let's all stand together on this Sunday night. We're going to sing song number 540. It's just like His great love, song 540. And uh, we're going to start a friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. Let's sing it all together on the first. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. So I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine. And you're going to have those days, you've experienced them, where the love of Christ just puts a song in your heart. So let the love of Christ fill our hearts tonight as we sing this last verse together. Give it your best on the fourth. Oh, I could sing forever. Oh, I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine. song number 265 my anchor holds though the angry surges roll my anchor holds all together on the first though the angry surges
encourage you to grab a songbook, and the reason why I'm challenging the men is because there's a men part on that chorus, and you'll see the bottom line, the men sing a little bit different of words there, and so if you're a man, go ahead and grab it. We're going to sing that chorus together on the second Mighty Tides About Me Sweep. Ready? Mighty Tides About Me But in Christ I can be bold. Let's sing boldly together, nice and loud, on the fourth. Troubles almost whelm the soul. Troubles almost whelm the soul. Grieves like billows o'er me roll. Tempters seek to lure astray. Storms obscure the light of holds to the rock Jesus Christ boy there's a lot of shifting sands today isn't there a lot of people saying this and then the next week it's changed to something else but aren't you glad Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever he never changes and we hold on to him we put our anchor in him and he leads us safely through to the other side oh what a rock what an anchor in Jesus Christ. Thanks for being here tonight at Central Valley Baptist Church. As you can tell, uh, we're missing our pastor tonight. He and his family are taking a, a little trip this week. So thankful they get to do that. And so they're going to spend some time away to focus on themselves and encourage them and have sweet time together. We pray God helps them have a great time. But excited to be with you tonight in church. It is great to be in the house of God. I was talking to someone this morning, I was someone in this senior class, and, and I said, I love church. And she said, I love church too because I need it. I thought, wow, that, that, that ought to be all of our attitude. We need church. It, it, we can't just take it or leave it. How do I feel about coming? No, no, no. I need this place. I need you. I need, I need to be able to shake your hand and, and or give you a fist bump, whatever we're doing, and say hello and, and be encouraged. I need to be able to sing a song like my anchor hold. I need that. I need that in my life. I know you do too. What a blessing it is to be in church tonight. Well, let's pray and ask God to meet with us this evening. All that God has in store, may God encourage us and draw us close to him. Let's pray and our choir will sing. Heavenly Father, thank you so much 
that we have an anchor that holds securely and holds firmly. That as the winds and storms of life come, God, and they blow and sometimes blow very hard. Lord, thank you that we're firmly secured in you. Thank you that the Bible says in John 10 that we're in your hand and nobody could pluck us out. Thank you for that assurance we have. Thank you that because we're anchored to you, that God, you will bring us through this pilgrimage here on earth. And God, one day we'll be with you forever and ever and ever and ever in eternal bliss in heaven. We look forward to that day. But for now, God, we want to serve you with our lives as best we can. I pray you bless our church service. Lord, we miss our pastor tonight. Boy, what a gift he is to us. We love him. We pray for him and his wife, his children. God, would you give them safety as they travel. Give them a sweet time together, a great vacation. Thank you for them and all they do for us every day. I pray you bless them. God, would you meet with us tonight in a special way. Through the choir song, through the congregational singing, Lord, I pray your spirit would be evident. Help us, God, to be in tune with you. And when the word of God is opened, and Holy Spirit, you begin to speak to our hearts, may we be receptive to what you want to tell us. And come invitation time, may we come down to an altar. And God, maybe thank you for some things, maybe repent of some things, maybe commit to some things. But God, may we not let this church service go without going face to face with you and allowing you to work in our hearts tonight. Bless your dear people for being faithful to the house of God. Meet with us tonight, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated.
song number 115, Living for Jesus, a life that is true. All together on the first, living for Jesus, a life that is true. that second living for Jesus who died in my place all together on the second living for Jesus who died in my place bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace to answer on the last living for Jesus through worst little while my dearest treasure the light of his smile seeking the lost ones he died to seated as the ushers make their way forward with the service guide tonight. If you need the service guide or the sermon notes, go ahead and slip up your hand and the ushers will get that to you. And if you are here tonight and it is your first time or maybe your first time in a very long while, we're so glad you chose to be with us in the service tonight. As you can see on the screens, we have a gift for you. And I don't know if you're like me, sometimes I feel bad taking something, but we want you to have the gift. And so if you're a guest today, uh, in seat pocket in front of you, you'll find one of these connection cards right here. Go ahead and fill this out. And you have two options. You can either drop it off in the offering plate as it goes by, or you can hand deliver it to the person at the podium at the end of the service. And we'll be so thrilled that you're our guest today. We'd love to meet you and give you this gift box for you and your family as our way of saying thank you for being our guest. 
Thank you, Bill Linder. And uh, he does a great job of song leading, huh? And that was wonderful. Good singing tonight. I love these songs. And I want to mention, if I could briefly, our M22 campaign. We've had such a fantastic time every week, and uh, especially on Saturdays, going out. Our map captains are organizing teams to go out to Lathrop and uh, Manteca North, Manteca Central. And we've just had a fantastic time uh, taking the gospel out uh, to the neighborhoods this past week. I want to encourage you, if you've not been a part of that, there's no better time to start than now. And uh, get, okay, let's try it again. If you've not been a part, there's no better time to start than right now. And you want to be a part of getting the gospel to somebody else. Don't let that be just somebody else's job. No, 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 no. You want to be a part of that. And I was so blessed. Pastor shared a testimony this morning, someone working in ministry, so maybe didn't get to hear it. Uh, but there's a lady in our church who was ill for, for some time, wasn't able to come to church and, and not able to go out and on, on, on door to door and pass these out. But she told Pastor every single Saturday uh, when, the, when the team is going out, she's praying that God will do a work through this. And man, she's just as much a part of the team as anybody else going out there. And what God is doing is just wonderful. We've been able to see a large number of invitations go out to those uh, in the area. This morning, I met a lady. Uh, I think her name was Monica, if I, if I remember correctly. And uh, met her, saw, saw her come into the church service. And, and anytime I see someone I don't recognize, I think, that must be a visitor. Praise the Lord. And so I'm praying, Lord, would you, would you speak to her heart, help her to get saved? She's not saved. And after the end of the service, uh, some of the ladies had already been talking to her and welcoming her to the church. And, and so someone brought, brought her to me at the guest welcome area and said, this is Monica. And she's already saved. She already knows Christ is saved. I thought, that's great. And so I asked her, how did you hear about the church? She said, well, um, I searched Bible church in Google and your church came up and I've been praying where I should go to church. And so I've been looking at this church and seeing online. And then I was praying, Lord, would you please show me what church I should go to? And then yesterday I came home and I found this in my door. And I said, I think God was telling me I should go to this church. I think you're right. I think that's exactly right. And so uh, that now, now that person wasn't even home when we left an invitation, but God used it. And she came to church and she was just so overjoyed to find a church that preaches the word of God. That's what she's been looking for. And so, uh, and many other, we couldn't share all, there's not enough time. But all that to say that you don't have to be the most, you don't have to know the answer to every Bible question. Nobody knows the answer to every Bible question. But if you can be willing to go out and give someone a gospel tract, you never know what God can do. So I want to encourage you. Come out this Saturday. If Saturday doesn't work for you, and you say, you know, that I'm working on Saturday, talk to the staff. Let us know. We'll try to figure out a way to, to come out with you during the week. I know, I know many every week go out, not on Saturday, but on Monday or on Thursday. Every week between Sunday to Saturday, we have about 500 tracks that go out on doors, at least 500 every single week. People whose schedule doesn't fit the weekend to do this, but they make sure they're a part of the effort. So I want to encourage you, please be a part of this. Uh, when we get towards the end of the year, when we get to show the number that, hey, we've reached 40,000 doors, you want to be able to say, I had a part in that. And uh, not to pat out yourself on that, no, 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 but just to say, man, I had skin in that game. It was great. And uh, be able to see God do something wonderful. Gentlemen, do we have that video ready uh, that we played this morning? And some of you didn't get to watch it because you're in ministry in the morning. It's an encouraging video about someone that got to lead someone to Christ. You're going to love it. Let's watch that at this time. We went up to the store. I, I thought it was like an abandoned home or empty home because the grass was grown up all around. There was no cars in the driveway. There was no cars in the street. And this young man opens the door. I'm thinking 20, 20 something. He's like, oh, I, I'm Catholic, but you know, I believe in God. Even though I don't go to church, I believe in God. And when anybody ever says that to me, I try to encourage that, you know, they, it's not, there's no wrong answer. I said, that's great. It sounds like you have a, a healthy fear and reverence of God. And that's great. But you know, more important than going to church is going to heaven. And I wonder if you know that for sure. And it's like, no, I don't know that. I said, you know what? I can show you what the Bible says because it's not what I think. It's not what my church thinks. It's what, what does God say? And he looked for a minute and said, like, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead, show me, show me. And I was like, yes. And he prayed and I said, his name is Isaiah, by the way. I said, Isaiah, um, congratulations. You've just accepted Christ. You did what the verse said. You called upon the Lord and, and he saved you because that's his promise. And uh, he says to me, he says, you know, last night my ex-girlfriend called me and she told me, you'll, you'll never change. You're never going to change. And he looked at me and he said, but I'm changed, huh? I'm different. And I said, I 
say, yes, the Bible says you're a new creature. Behold, all things are passed away and you're, you're new in Christ. And at that moment, I thought, this is a divine appointment. It felt amazing because I had this expectation of the person that's going to open this door is going to be mad because I got them out of bed on a Saturday morning. I'm telling you, it was the sweetest experience because he was so open. And I was thinking, what if I hadn't come? What if we hadn't, what if I hadn't knocked on the door? What if I had just left the, the hangar or thought, oh, no one's here, it's a, you know, no one lives here, whatever. So it's just the, that moment, that sweet moment where he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to pray, I want to do it. It's just like, Lord, you're so awesome. And I got a front row seat to this miracle, right? When you see someone just so sweetly pray and receive Christ. It's just, there's nothing like that. We get so busy as Christians, we're so busy, we're a busy church, we're busy ministry, this and that, but really what, what makes God smile is when we give the gospel, when we go out and we're faithful. And all God's people said, amen. Doesn't that fire you up? Somebody got saved. Man, I'll try it again. I said, somebody got saved. Oh, may that never get old for us to hear about someone who bowed their head and passed from death to life, headed for hell, now headed for heaven, a child of devil, now a child of God. Oh, let that fire you up and encourage you. Oh, what a blessing to see people accept Jesus Christ. That was fantastic. Thank you, Mrs. Perry, for doing that video. And uh, we have some others coming up soon you're going to enjoy. And it's just amazing to see what God is doing. Ushers, would you come, please, and with the offering plates, we'll take the offering tonight. And I want to encourage you, for whatever reason uh, you missed this morning, Pastor preached a fantastic message uh, in the beginning of his new series about putting God first. Talked about a lot of things, but he touched a little bit on finances. And boy, talked about how that it's all about our heart. God wants our heart. Oh, it was such a good message, straight from the Bible, so helpful. If you were in ministry this morning, I know many of you are in junior church or Sunday school, or sometimes you're doing double duty. You don't get to hear the message. Maybe you're on your way to work tomorrow or whenever. Uh, watch that. It'll help you to encourage you. It's a great, great message. And uh, I'm so glad that th this church, uh, the preaching is preeminent here. Christ is preeminent. Now, the preaching is prominent. I'll put it that way. Christ is preeminent, but the preaching is prominent. And the Bible is open. And our pastor brings fantastic messages. I want to encourage you, if you're visiting tonight, please come back and hear him preach. He's a pulpiteer. You'll enjoy it and meet him and his family. Thanks for being here tonight for church. Brother Vieira, would you come and pray for us? And appreciate Brother Vieira, all that he does for our church. Would you pray? Ask God's blessing on our offering. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this night that we can come to church, Lord, and hear your word preached to us, God. We Pray that you'll uh, give a special protection to our preacher as he's away with his family. Keep him safe as he's traveling. God, we love you so much. Thank you for all you do for us. We ask you to bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Russell, let's all stand together. Song 332. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. There are things as we travel this earth shifting sands. And one of the things that is great about this song is that it causes you to stop and reflect on what Jesus did for us on that cross on Calvary. Let's think about that as we sing these verses together. There are things as we travel this earth shifting sense that transcend all the reason of man but the things that matter the most in this world they can never be held in our hand I believe in a hill called Mount Cow
cross has the power to change lives today. singing, you may be seated. All things work for our good, though sometimes we don't see how they could. Struggles that break our hearts in two sometimes blind us to the truth our father knows what's best for us his ways are not our own so when your pathway grows dim and you just don't see him remember you're never alone too wise to be mistaken God is too good to be unkind so when you don't understand when you don't see his plan when you can't trace his hand trust his heart trust his heart he sees the master plan our future in his hand so don't live as those who have no hope all our hope is found in him we see the present clearly but he sees the first and the last and like a tapestry he's weaving you And trust is on He alone is faithful and true He alone knows what is best for you God is too wise to be mistaken God is too good to be unkind When you don't understand his plan when you can't trace his
Jesus and trust is hard when you don't understand when you don't see his plan when you can't trace his hand trust is hard trust is hard thank you brother Russell that's one of those songs it's not a jump up and down and shout but boy get you right here thank you brother I so appreciate that let's all stand together please in Exodus chapter 15, I love that song, that helped me. Exodus 15, excited to be able to preach the Bible to you tonight, and I appreciate you being faithful to church. Guys, I'm going to switch to my lapel, all right, just so you know. Exodus chapter number 15, and we're going to be in verse 20. Exodus 15 and verse 20, and there's no book like the Bible. Let's try that again. There's no book like the Bible. And uh, we get to open the Word of God and get to read it and get to hear what God wants us to have. And boy, I love the Bible. Hope you enjoy reading the Scripture and hearing the Scripture. And I hope I can be a help through the Word of God this evening. Exodus chapter 15 and verse number 20. Here's what the Bible says. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Tonight, with God's help, I want to preach this, why we ought to dance in church. No, just kidding. Verse 21. <laughs> and Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses. That phrase we seem to find often in the Old Testament. The people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? He cried unto the Lord. The Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. There he proved them. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptian. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. In this scripture, we see somewhat of a microcosm of the Christian life. The Christian life is not all a mountaintop experience, nor is it always a valley experience. Life in general is not that way, neither is the Christian life. It has its highs when spiritually we feel like we're firing on all cylinders, and it has its lows when we feel like we're going nowhere and we're in a fog. The stories of the children of Israel are great examples and illustrations for us of different phases and experiences in the Christian life. In our text, we find the children of Israel had just crossed the Red Sea and watched God safely deliver every last one of them. God didn't lose one when they crossed the Red Sea. Every single one of them came safely across. And God completely destroyed their enemies, the Egyptians. Then they encounter a tough time, we'll read, but God comes through like He always does. And I believe there are some lessons we can learn from this text. Our story starts with a victory and ends with a victory. But in between those two points, we see a time of uncertainty, a time of struggle, a valley between the victories, you could say. With God's help, I want to bring this message tonight, the valley between the victories. The valley between the victories. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. So thankful to be able to open the Word of God, to be able to see what you have for us. I pray you'd bless your dear people for being faithful to your house this evening. And God, they certainly did not come to hear me. They came to hear you, and I pray that's what would happen this night. I pray, God, you'd use me to be your mouthpiece, and I pray, Lord, that Holy Spirit, you would take the scriptures that are said and the words that I say, and you would help somebody tonight. And God, if no one else needs us tonight, I certainly know I do. And I pray, God, you'd speak to us through your word. Thank you for your love for us. Help us to learn the scripture and learn what you want us to do in response to it this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The first uh, phase we see here I'd like to notice is in verses 20 and 21. Let's read those again if you could, verse 20 and 21. The Bible says, And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, 
And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. You see the children of Israel singing and giving praise to God for the incredible victory and triumph he gave at the Red Sea crossing. May I say, number one, I want us to notice the praise. If you're taking notes, number one, I want you to notice the praise. They recount here how God worked in a miraculous fashion. It was awesome. I know we're so, we hear the Red Sea story. We've learned it since we were a kid and we know what happened. But can you put yourself for a moment, if you can try, to put yourself in the mind frame, in the mindset of these children of Israel. They, they, they had, had just seen something incredible happen. Can you see them? Can you picture them as they just crossed over and the waters came and destroyed? Can you picture them in your mind? Smiles all around. Man, the vibes were up. The people were high-fiving each other. Uh, They were cheering. They're picking each other up. Uh, Moms were holding their babies, crying tears of thankfulness and joy. Families were huddled with their dads, wrapping their arms around their kids, looking up to heaven, thanking God that they're alive and that they're safe. They were on an emotional roller coaster. They had just had the exodus from Egypt, and they're finally out of bondage. But guess who's coming after them? Pharaoh's not far behind. And whereas it was, yes, now it's, we're going to die. You know, and they're complaining to Moses. And so they're, and, and man, there's the Red Sea. We're going to either drown or they're going to kill us. And then God says, oh, I have this under control. And God splits the Red Sea and they cross on dry ground, not muddy ground. Their feet didn't get stuck. Dry, that's a miracle, my friends, dry ground. And they go across there and they look back and God brings the water back and destroys all. Can, can, you, can you picture them there? And the joy and rejoicing that they had, it's kind of like, if you're a sports fan, and uh, uh, I'm kind of a sport, I don't like all sports, I don't understand all of them, and I don't have time for, I don't have time for the one I like, but, but you know what I mean, nonetheless, uh, I, I enjoy it, and uh, if you're a sports fan, and your team wins a big game, whether it be basketball, or football, or baseball, or so- soccer sport, I don't know, I'm just kidding, and uh, whatever else you have there, and, uh, and they win a big game, and you're a fan, hey, guess what, that whole week, Man, you're reliving those moments. You're thinking, you're talking to your friends like, man, you remember that one time where that guy made, he messed up and I was so mad. I thought, there it is, we're going to lose. Again, we're going to lose. I was so mad. But then at the very end, man, this guy did this and he pulled him in. It was amazing. And you recount those and you relish all those incredible moments of that wild victory. That's what they're doing in this chapter. Let's look at it briefly, can we? They're relishing the moments of what God did, recounting all that God did. Turn to chapter 15. And look at verse 3 through 5. The Lord is a man of war. What are they saying? They say, man, you don't mess with God. (laughs) The Lord's a man of war. Look what he did. Uh, The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also were drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom as a stone. Verse 9. The enemy said, again, they're recounting what was happening. The enemy said, I will pursue I will overtake, I'll divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied, I'll draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. They're saying, remember, we were crossed, we were looking back, and the Egyptians were looking at us going, I'm going to get you, you're dead meat. And they they, they said they were going to kill us. Verse 10, thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. And remember, remember, Moses put up his rod, all of a sudden we saw the waters come down, man, they were all, you remember the look of terror on their face, they thought they were going to get us, and God got the best of them, and they're reliving those moments and recounting how wonderful was that God did. Verse 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing Wonders, Verse 19, for the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea. The Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them, but the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. May it remind us tonight, as the children of Israel took time to praise God for what he did there, enjoy the times of victory in your life and praise God for them. It's okay to make a big deal about God doing something great for you. That's all right. That's okay. And man, just rejoice in what God has done. When God answers a prayer, rejoice. Relish in that moment when God delivers you from a tough situation. Rejoice in the Lord. Too often I think we miss opportunities to rejoice and praise God and enjoy what He's done for us. Psalm 107 tells us this, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. For His mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say what? Say what it said in verse 1, that he is good, that his mercy endures, whom he hath redeemed from the hand 
of the enemy. There's a story told of a king who went out hunting game with his friend. As the king shot the arrow, his thumb came clean off. His friend looked at him and said, praise God, because he's in control. The king didn't like that answer. He was furious and threw his friend in jail. Some time later, the king was hunting when he ventured into a distant land where he had never been before. Suddenly, he was surrounded by cannibals. They tied him up. They were ready to cook him when they saw the hand that, was having, that had the missing thumb. No perfect, no cookie, said the chief, and they let him go. He went back to his friend and apologized. You were right. Not having a thumb saved my life. His friend said, praise God, I've been in jail for so long. The king says again with this praise God about stuff. He said, how can you praise God this time? The king asked. If I hadn't been in jail, I would have been hunting with you. And look, two thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, all uh, the facility story, but all that to say, hey, you can praise God a little bit. You can, there, so you can praise God for things in your life. That's all right. That's okay every once in a while to say, Lord, you're so good. God, you're amazing. It's okay to do that. And boy, we see here the praise that they gave God. Too many Christians are pouting when they ought to be praising and simply enjoying the goodness of God in their lives. Were all the children of Israel's problems solved? No. Was everything going to be easy from here on out? No. But they took time to praise God, enjoy His goodness, and rejoice in what He had just done for them. Isaiah 25, the prophet said this, O Lord, Thou art my God. I will exalt Thee. I will praise Thy name. Why? For Thou hast done wonderful things. Who in the church tonight can attest to the fact that God has done something wonderful for you in your life? Oh, my friends. Every one of us, God's done something and more than one thing wonderful. We ought to praise Him for it. Psalm 28, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song, I will praise Him. Let's learn from the children of Israel and imitate the praise they gave God. When I was developing this, I thought about this song. It's a song called, For All He's Done. You may have heard it. The lyrics say, Every morning when I wake to see the sun, I can't help but think about the Lord and all the things He's done. He meets my every need. You know He's been so good to me, and I can't help but praise the Lord for all He's done. For all He's done, I'm going to lift my hands and praise Him. For all He's done, I'll try to live my life to please Him. Even though I don't deserve to live, my life has just begun, and I can't help but praise the Lord for all He's done. Oh, we see the children of Israel, they had a time of praise. May I encourage you, don't lose the praise in your life. Don't lose that. God does too much for us for us not to praise Him. I'll say it again. God does way too much for us for us not to praise Him. Oh, let's praise Him in our lives. May I say number two, and I must hasten. Look at verses 22 through 24. Same chapter, Exodus 15. The Bible says this, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. In other words, they came in, they found water, and they were excited about the water, and they realized they couldn't drink the water. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? When we, number two, I want us to notice the peril. The peril. When we encounter peril, too often we like to pout and protest instead of praying to the one who has the power. Uh, and that tends to be what we as human beings like to do. We like to uh, have a pity party for ourselves and say, Lord, why this? And we get upset. But instead of saying, Moses, would you please ask God to help us here? Not long ago, he did something incredible we've never seen before. He parted a whole sea. I'm sure he can just help this little, this little bit of water here. I'm sure he can do that. That's not what they did. Uh, they, 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 we need another miracle, what they should have said. We know this is God's area of expertise. Would you ask him to help us? But that's not what they did. They needed a miracle. Now, you know how far removed they were from the Red Sea miracle? You can find it in verse 22. The Bible says they went three days in the wilderness. Three days, 72 hours from the most amazing thing they'd ever seen in their life. Instead of saying, God, you did this up here. Could you just do this right here? Instead of that, they say, Moses, what are we going to do? Oh, they were in peril. It's amazing how quickly we forget what God has done once difficulty shows up. Once struggle comes, once the peril comes, once the phone call comes, once the bill comes, and you fill in the blank. It's amazing how quickly we forget all that God has brought us through to get us to this point. We get spiritual amnesia. 
a struggle comes, and instead of turning to God immediately, because he's proven himself time and time and time and time again, we decide to whine and complain. I'm not throwing stones at the children of Israel here. If I was without water for three days, I'd probably do the same thing that they did. So I'm not throwing stones at them. It's just amazing to see how that difficulty in our lives can cause us to forget the goodness of God. We find in the next chapter they do the same thing, Exodus 16. If you're there, you can see it, verses 2 and 3. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. We find it later in Numbers 11. Don't turn there, I'll read it to you. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. The children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. That's a gourmet meal right there. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Hang on a second. What Egypt experience are you remembering, Israel? Are you referring to the time when you didn't own yourself and you were literally slaves to Pharaoh? Did you forget the hard, back-breaking work in the desert, unshielded from the glaring sun? Did you forget the beatings and whippings from the taskmasters? That was not a fun time in your history. Yet in the midst of their current peril, their spiritual amnesia kicks in, and they forgot how bad it was back in Egypt. In Scripture, Egypt is often used as a type or a picture of the world. It illustrates for us life lived outside of God's will. And Israel here is thinking we might have been better off before we started following God into this desert. At least in Egypt, we had bread, we had fish, cucumbers, melons. You know, Egypt really wasn't as bad when you think about it. That's what they were saying. But that was delusional. That was not reality. Egypt was terrible. Their lives were, the Bible says, bitter with hard bondage. Their baby boys were ordered to be killed by fair. They cried to God for deliverance every single day. Egypt was not good. Now let's learn a lesson here. We must be careful in our own lives that when peril strikes, not to look back to a time before redemption and think it was better then. It was easier then. It wasn't this hard back then. And get tempted to look back into the world for the answer for relief from the tough situation you're in. Egypt wasn't the answer for Israel back then, and the world isn't the answer for God's children today. I'll say it one more time. Egypt wasn't the answer for Israel back then, and the world is not the answer for God's people today. And all we must be careful of that. When we face that peril, the devil will try to whisper, it was better before you quit drinking. The devil will tell you it was better before you quit smoking. It was better before you stopped watching that junk on TV or before you stopped watching that junk on your phone. But it wasn't better before that. You see, the devil, look at him for the liar that he is and reject those downright delusional thoughts when the peril comes. Don't look back to Egypt. Look up to God when the peril comes. I think of the story of Paul and Silas. They're preaching. What happens? They get caught. They get beaten and thrown in jail. Acts 16 tells us, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. In their peril, Paul and Silas weren't saying, Boy, we made the wrong life choice, didn't we? Sure was better before we started following Christ. When we get out, we, we should go back to our previous lives. It'll be easier. No, no, no. That's not what they were doing at all. They rejected that line of thinking and instead were looking up to God. May we learn from this story in Israel's history. Not to look to go backward when times get tough, but instead look up to God who is in control of it all. No one likes it when times get tough and they get difficult. But the psalmist put it this way in Psalm 31, 15. He said, my times are in thy hand. My times, the good times, they're in your hand. The tough times, they're in your hand. All of my times in my life are in your hand. And when we face the peril, oh, don't, 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 look, don't look for a way to bail. Don't look for a way to go back to the world. No, 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 no. Look up to God who has the answer for you. We see the praise. We see the peril. They say, number three, look at verse 25. We see the provision. The Bible says, And he, Moses, cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. 
Aren't you glad tonight that God always has the answer for our perilous situations? He always does. Uh, there's a quote by a lady named Corey Ten Boom. If you don't know who she is, she, uh, The Hiding Place is her book, and, and she was a Dutch uh, watchmaker and, uh, during the World War II time, and her and her family were harboring Jews, hiding them from the Germans that wanted to kill them. And they got caught hiding the Jews, and her and her sister Betsy got taken to Ravensbrück concentration camp, and where Corey Ten Boom watched her sister uh, wither and eventually perish uh, of, of, of all the struggle and terrible treatment there. But she said this quote, in the midst of all that peril, she said, there is no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans. Wow, that hits me hard. As someone who went through such incredible, intense, intense, terrible, inhumane things, she says, there's no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans. Moses throws in the tree, and the bitter brackish water was made sweet. And I say, God is a master at taking tough, hard situations and turning them on their heads, and we become the beneficiaries of it. Oh, it's incredible. We go back to that story in Acts, and have to turn there. We, we, we referenced Paul and Silas earlier. What happened in their story when they praised God? What did God provide for them? The Bible says in Acts 16, suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword, would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came, trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. God took a perilous situation, and he made a way. May I say tonight, if you're in the peril right now, God has a way. God has a way. You may not be able to see the way yet, but God has a way. Don't bail. Don't quit. No, 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 no. God, God knows where you're at. God knew when you would be there. God knew where you would be, when you would be. Hang on. God has a plan. Spurgeon said this, as soon as we have a prayer, God has a remedy. The remedy is near at hand, but we do not perceive it till it is shown us. The Bible says in this story, the Lord showed him a tree. That tree had been growing for years on purpose to be used for that moment. God has a remedy for all our troubles before they happen to us. A delightful employment it is to notice how God forestalls himself, how long before we reach the encampment, if there be the bitter well, there is also the healing tree. All that is ready between here and heaven, he that has gone to prepare a place for us by his presence, has prepared the way to that place for us by his providence. But brethren, though for every trouble in this mortal life there is a remedy, you and I do not always discern it. The Lord showed him a tree. May I say, whatever pair you're looking at, God will show you the tree. God will show you the answer. And I, that, that's not to say, don't misunderstand me, that's not to say you're going to understand everything that happens. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is God will show you the way. And when you can't see the way, and it's darkness, God will give you light and show you the way. That's what he does. There's something, though, greater being pictured here than just the waters turning sweet for Israel to drink, I want us to think about. God was picturing for us his perfect plan of salvation. Oh, I love this. Before Christ, the waters of our life were bitter. We were heading for death and doom with no hope in sight. Oh, but God took a tree. He took that old rugged cross. And because the one who died on that tree, our lives were changed from bitter to sweet. 1 Peter 2 says this, Who his own self, speaking of Christ, bear, his, bear our sins in his own body on the tree. What a glorious picture of salvation. Whereas we were drowning in bitter waters, the cross of Christ turned those waters sweet, and we live in joy and forgiveness and blessing because of the tree. Hallelujah for the cross of Christ. We see, first of all, the praise. We see the peril. We see God's provision. May I say number four, and I have to finish. We see the promise. Look at verse 26. Exodus 15, 26, we see the promise. And said, this is God, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. That name is Jehovah Rapha. 
the God who healed. To the extent that I brought hardship on the Egyptians, I'll bring healing to you. What a promise. But I noticed it was a conditional promise. He said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the Lord, if you do that which is right in his sight, if you give ear to his commandments, if you keep all his statutes. The healing came because Moses followed God's instructions and threw in the exact tree God told him to throw in. The Bible says God showed him a tree. God says, Moses, it's that one. If Moses said, well, I want to throw in this one, wouldn't have worked. He had to follow God's instruction. And when we follow God's instruction, there's a promise attached with that. If we do what God wants us to do, he promises to bless us. He promises to help us. Too often we want the promise without the parameters. We want all the blessings of God without all the boundaries of where God wants us to live inside of. God says, if you simply trust and obey me, I'll take care of you. Let this scripture remind us tonight, if we trust and obey our Heavenly Father, we can be confident in His promise to bless and take care of us in our lives. We see the praise. We see the peril. We see the provision. We see the promise. Lastly, we see the paradise. Look at verse 27. The Bible says, And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water. And three score and ten, that's 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. God brought them to a paradise in the middle of the desert. And I say, God brought them through Mara to bring them to Elam. God didn't just bring them to Mara. God brought them through Mara to bring them to Elam. They remind us tonight, the hardships you face are bumps along the way as you travel through this world. The perils and trials will pale in comparison to the paradise that awaits every child of God. For God's children, our journeys end up at the same destination, God's perfect paradise in heaven. Life down here may be full of trouble, but the Bible tells us it's as quick as a vapor. And then, eternity. For the saved, we end up in a beautiful, comfortable, incredible paradise called heaven. Turn to Revelation 21. I hope this will encourage you tonight. I love reading about heaven. It helps me. Revelation 21. Verses 1 through 5. I'm going to start reading. It's on the screen, I think, too. And I saw a new heaven, John says, and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. Wow. I can't wrap my brain around that. God himself shall be with them and be their God, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Verse 5, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said unto me, Write, for these words are true. Heaven's not a fairy tale, my friends. Heaven's not make-believe. No, all of it is true. It's more real than we are right here, right now. Oh, my friends, one day we'll be in that paradise in heaven. And some of you have somebody over there waiting for you, and we have Jesus Christ who will welcome us when we reach that day. Oh, the paradise of heaven for Christians. Our story ends in absolute, utter paradise as we'll live forever in heaven with God and family and friends who've accepted Christ as Savior. Maybe you're here tonight. You've never accepted Christ. You've never placed your faith in Him alone for salvation. Let me encourage you. You don't have to continue to drink the bitter waters of Mary in your life. Christ died on the tree, that old rugged cross, so that you and your life could be healed. You don't have to live in the misery of sin. All you have to do is ask Christ to be your Savior, and He'll save you. He'll take your sin-sick soul, wash it white as snow. Your sins will be forgiven, and your eternal home secure in heaven. If you've never done that, let me encourage you. Please accept Christ today. Don't walk out of this church building without knowing for sure Christ is your Savior. I close with this. What lessons can we learn in the victories and in the valleys? Number one, praise God for the victories. Praise God for the victories. He's the one who gives them. Praise God for those. I say number two, trust God through the valleys. Praise God for the victories, but trust Him through the valleys. F.B. Meyer, that... Baptist preacher of yesteryear said this, Now for us there is but one way to bear sorrow and to extract its sweetness. We must yield our will to God. We must accept what He permits. We must do what He bids. Here it is. So we come to find that disappointments 
are His appointments. Disappointments are His appointments. God knew that He would heal the waters. But God wanted Israel to know that. God brought them through Mara so Israel would learn and experience firsthand God. God could have healed the waters before they ever came there. He could have done that. No, no, no. But God wanted them to realize, and when you can't do it, there's nothing you can do. I will step in and help you. And that's what God did for them that day. Number three, and I'll close. The only constant in life is God's goodness and care. The only constant in life is God's goodness and care. Hey, people change. The world changes. We ourselves change. All sorts of things swirl around us, but God never changes. He's constant. In every perilous situation, God delivered Israel. May I say we serve that same God. Whether we're in the praise stage or the peril stage or any other stage, God's goodness remains constant. We will go through the ups and downs of life. Sometimes the ups are really high. Sometimes the downs are really low. But just like God was there for His children in the wilderness, your Heavenly Father is there for you. God will bring you through your Mara for the purpose of bringing you to your Elam. There's a song called God is Always Right. I want to read you the lyrics. It says this, God is always good. God is always right. No matter what He uses, no matter what He chooses to place within our lives, we may not always understand the unfolding of His perfect plan. But even through the darkest night, God is always good. And God is always right. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, that through the example of the children of Israel, we see how you brought them through Marah to Elam. And God, I believe you want to do the same for us in our lives. You want to bring us through the valley, God, on to victory. And I pray for those in the room tonight, God. Some, they're in that praise stage, Lord. And it's going great. They're on the spiritual high, and they're firing on all cylinders for you. But Lord, maybe that peril's coming. For some, they're in the peril right now. God, it's tough. The waters are bitter. God, they need you. God, I pray that tonight they'd submit their will to you. And God, like you did in the Old Testament, and you showed a tree that made the waters sweet, I pray you'd show your children a tree tonight. And God, you'd help them along their way and give the healing that they need. Thank you, God, that you provided that, God. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that if we follow you and do what you want us to do, God, you'll always be there to help us. And thank you, God, that in the end, it ends in paradise. We're in heaven with you. When it's all said and done, we thank you for that. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you a question. How many here say, I remember when I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I know without a shadow of a doubt, if tonight I were to draw my last breath, I know I'd see my Savior. If that's you, could I see your hand? Would you hold it up high? God bless your hands all over. Maybe you couldn't raise your hand there. Maybe you say, preacher, I don't know for sure heaven's my home. I'd like to know, but, but I sure don't know right now. Would you pray for me? I promise I will not embarrass you, make you stand or come to the front, but I do want to pray for you. We care about you. We want you to know for sure heaven can be your home. If that's you, you say, preacher, I just don't know that. Would you pray for me? Could I see your hand tonight all across the house? Anybody tonight in the room, I just don't know. Would you pray for me? I'll do it. Can I see your hand? Christians, how about it? Are you in the praise phase in the Christian life? Maybe you're in the peril, phrase, peril phase. And boy, you need God's help. And I say, he's there to bring you through. Just like he was for the children of Israel, he's going to bring you through that bitterness. He's going to bring you through to Elam. You just got to hang on to him. Can we stand? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The piano plays. Christians, would you come and pray? God has no problems, only plans. There's no panic in heaven. God has it all under control. God allowed the children of Israel to taste those bitter waters. He didn't have to do that, but he did it on purpose. He allowed them to taste that so they could look up to him and say, God, you've got to help us here. And God said, I, I know. I was already planning on taking care of it for you. Moses, there's your tree. Maybe it's not you to ask God for that tree. Say, Lord, I have bitter waters in my life. Would you help me? Would you show me the tree, God? Maybe you just are in a state of victory. 
Oh, praise the Lord for what he's done. Praise him. Don't miss those prime praise opportunities in your life. When God shows himself strong, oh, don't miss that. Take time to praise God. Maybe tonight you just need to thank God for heaven. Say, Lord, thank you that, like the angel said, right for these sayings are true. Thank you, Lord, that heaven's real. And whereas on this earth things may not go the way we want them to, and maybe it'll be a rough go from here on out. Oh, but this life's a vapor. Heaven's eternity. We'll be there together one day. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, Christians are praying. And maybe you say, I'm not in the peril now. Oh, but maybe you have peril down the road. Would you put this in your pocket? Would you remember the admonition from the scripture? Trust God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for the example of the children of Israel. Lord, they went, they went through Mara. God, they didn't end there, Lord. They went through it. You brought them through it. And God, you will bring us through the valley, God, on to the victory. And I pray you'd help the children of God tonight, myself included. Help us to hang on to you. And God, help us not to look back to Egypt, look back to the world. God, the world has never had the answer. They have never had the answer. Help us not to look to them, but to look upward and skyward to our Father, who has his hand over us, who can take care of us. Help us to trust you in our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for your great attention. Now, let's be seated. Watch what's coming up next in Central Valley Baptist Church. Hi, I'm Lydia, and you're watching Up Next. There's always something happening at CVBC, and we'd love for you to be a part. Here are some of the events coming up at our church. If you're a first-time guest today, we are so glad you're here. We have a special gift for you after the service. Just fill out the connection card in the seat pocket in front of you and turn it in at the guest welcome banner in the lobby. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Today, after the 11 a.m. service, we will have a special kickoff meeting and lunch for our hospitality team as we discuss the vision for the new year. If you'd like to be a part of this great team of volunteers who welcome guests and members to church every Sunday, Join us after the 11 a.m. service in Modular 2 for this great time together. Don't miss the Hospitality Team Luncheon this afternoon. We're so excited for our upcoming Winter Revival next week with Dr. John Getch on February 20th through 23rd. We will enjoy great messages all day Sunday and every evening Monday through Wednesday. This is going to be a special week of meetings that you will not want to miss. Join us for our Winter Revival Sunday through Wednesday next week. For more information on what's coming up, head to mantica.church slash events. Thanks for watching, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Let's all stand together, please. We'll dismiss with a word of prayer. I do want to encourage you about the revival meeting starting next Sunday. And so the next Lord's Day, Dr. John Getch will be here to preach the Bible to us. You don't want to miss that. It'll be a help to you. And then Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., and so if you can fit that in your schedule, make it a priority. Be here. The Lord will work in your heart for sure. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, how it encourages us, how it helps us, how it buoys us on, God, to live for you. I pray, God, you'd give your people a great week. I pray, God, you'd give us safety as we go our separate ways and go to work in the morning and all that we do. I pray, God, we'd live for you and honor you. I think about Pastor's message this morning about putting you first. I pray, God, that tomorrow when we wake up, we'll put you first. God, for Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and let you have the preeminence in our lives. Bless our people as we dismiss, God, and help us to live for you and be a witness for you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. You're dismissed.
Love will never give up on you.